Please rise and join me in the litany. God, we lament the destruction that has been done. That we have committed to be done. By our silence and inaction. In my Even now we realize that our home is it's suffering. Its inhabitants are suffering from lack of clean air and water, lack of life giving nourishment, lack of safe habitat. Help us to become aware of the needs of humanity, of the needs of generations to come, of the needs of creatures and plants. We acknowledge that we have a chance. To be caretakers of creation. To choose activity over complacency. To choose the greater good over today's convenience. Arousing us a new compassion. A new, a new willingness to change. A new excitement to foster community. A new, a new zeal for establishing the peace of God. A new understanding of the connectedness of all things. A new appreciation of the gift of earth. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you. This is the peace of victory for our God. Alleluia. Yeah, 
And so which story do we see the rainbow at the end of? Taller children, help out. The blood. The blood, Noah's Ark, yeah. So the rainbow is that, that promise, right? God's promise that he will not destroy the earth. He will not destroy the earth. Um, has God kept that promise? Sure he has. He always does. God has not destroyed the earth. He has not destroyed his creation. Uh, who does destroy his creation? <laughs> his other creation, <laughs> us. <laughs> yeah, so as we, as we go through our, our week and we're enjoying the beautiful spring weather and, and we see creation. We see the flowers and the trees and, and the allergies and, and all the great things that God has provided for us. And we might even see a rainbow. And I, I want to encourage you to remember that, that God keeps that promise not to destroy his creation. But that we might need to work a little bit harder on our side of that. So I, I want you to, to remember this Earth Day and to remember that. or buy something with less packaging, or something that helps this world that God has given us, that is so beautiful and so giving to us, and that he has promised not to destroy. We love you. We're so glad you're here today. <laughs> The first reading is from the first chapter, or the 20th chapter of Genesis, beginning at the first verse. And God said, Let the waters bring forth forms of living creatures, and let birds fly above the earth across the dome of the sky. So God created the great sea monsters and every living creature that moves of every kind with which the waters swarm, and every winged bird of every kind, and God saw that it was good. God blessed them, saying, Be fruitful and multiply, and fill the waters in the sea, and let birds multiply on the earth. And there was evening, and there was morning the fifth day. And God said, Let the earth bring forth living creatures of every kind, cattle and creeping things, and wild animals of the earth of every kind. And it was so. God made the wild animals of the earth of every kind, and the cattle of every kind, and everything that creeps upon the ground of every kind. And God saw that it was good. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please join me in the psalm reading, Psalm 8. O Lord, our Lord, O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You, you whose glory is chanted above the heavens, of the clouds of infants and children. You, you have set up before us against your enemies, silence the fellow of the enemy. When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars, you have set in their courses. What are your horses that you should be mindful of them, human beings that you should care for them? Yet you have made them little less than divine. With glory and honor you crown them. You have made them rule over the works of your hands. You have put all things under their feet. All flocks and cattle, even the wild beasts of the field, the birds of the air, the fish of the sea, and whatever passes along the paths of the sea. O oh Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. The second reading is from the 38th chapter of Job, beginning at the first verse. Then the Lord answered Job out of the world. Who is then the darkened counsel of my word without knowledge? Gird up your loins like a man. I will question you, and you shall declare to me. Where were you when I laid the foundation of the earth? Tell me if you have understanding. Who determined its measurement? Surely you know. Who or who stretched the line upon it? Or what were its base sunk? Or who laid its cornerstone when the morning stars sang together, and all the heavenly beings shouted for joy? 
Can you hunt the prey for the lion or satisfy the appetite of young lions when they crouch in their den or lie in wait for the cobra? Who provides for the raven and the prey when its young ones cry to God and wander about for lack of food? Do you know when the mountain goats give birth? Do you observe the calving of the deer? Can you number the months that they fulfill? And do you know the time when they give birth? When they crouch to give birth to their offspring and are delivered of their young. Their young ones become strong. They grow up in the open. They go forth and do not return to them. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. <laughs> extended period of time, <laughs> but I did find one that I thought was worth uh, sharing with you, and it's an old oldie and Lena joke. If you're a Minnesota Lutheran, you know, I guess that's where these uh, Ole and Lena jokes come from, but Ole was old and he was dying, and so the whole family gathered at the house to be at the bedside of Ole, and Ole said to Lena, his dear wife, is Lena here? Lena replied, yes, yes, Ole, I'm here. Oh, he said, and my sons and my daughters? Nina replied, yes, yes, they are all here. And their husbands and their wives. Oh, of course, of course, Oli, they're all here. And all their children and their children. Yes, yes, Oli, they're, they're all here, Lena said impatiently. Everyone's here. Then why is the light still on in the kitchen? <laughs> I could see myself saying that. <laughs> I'm good at saying that too. Well, I was uh, born in 1961, so I grew up in the 60s and 70s, and the first decade of my life was the advent of the environmental justice movement, or environmental movement. Around me, people were, were asking about how do we care for our earth? How do we care for God's creation? It was obvious that our earth, that God's creation is straining and breaking under, under the abuse of human pollution. I can remember signs in my hometown of Baton Rouge when we would go to City Park Lake, big signs right in the middle of the lake. Danger, no swimming, danger, no fishing, do not eat the fish. And as a kid, you're just like, what is, 
well, how can our world be so broken that you can't even swim off this pier or you can't catch fish and eat them? I remember as a child being worried about our world being full of hazardous chemicals and pollutants. I can vividly remember as a child learning about the American bald eagle and being excited about seeing an eagle, the very symbol of our country, and then learning that bald eagles were dying and their and pollution and chemical runoff was causing their, their eggs to break. And the only bald eagle I saw as a child was in the zoo, or it was in a book. I remember watching movies about the American West and dreaming of seeing a buffalo, only to learn that the buffalo herds were no more. No more were there great herds of buffalo in our American West. In fact, by the time I was a child, it was very close to extinction. By the 1970s, the people have had enough. Communities were demanding clean water, clean air, and land set aside for wildlife. In 1970, the Environmental Protection, Protection Agency was born. It was created by Congress, and it had bipartisan support. Republicans and Democrats said, we've got to do something to limit pollution in our great land. This is our land, and we have to put, put forth reasonable expectations that we're not just going to throw stuff away. And I remember one person saying, where is a way that it's probably impacting the environment in some way. So here we are 50 years later, bald eagles fly again. They even nest here in Tennessee. And I'm sure we've all seen a live bald eagle in the wild now. Buffaloes are in Shelby Farms Park just down the road. And they've been reestablished in Yellowstone. And larger and larger herds are now being seen in the Western United States, United States on protected federal land. So now, 50 years later, we can honestly say we have cleaner air and we have cleaner water than we did in the 70s. But now, of course, there's a new threat. And I'm sure you know all about it. It's called rising global temperatures. Rising global temperatures. We all know that burning fossil fuels leads to more carbon, which is then trapped in our atmosphere, which is leading to a slow rise in global temperatures. Of course, it is time to act, but the problem seems so big. It seems so beyond us. How can we act? And how will we, the church, how will we, the people of God, how will we act? How will we educate ourselves? How will we motivate and encourage politicians and policymakers to do the right thing so that we can limit the rising temperatures so that our grandchildren will have a green and vibrant earth to inherit as we once inherited a green and vibrant planet. A few years ago, I was down in Louisiana where I grew up, and my cousin said, you know, um, has a boat, and he has a, a, a camp on the Louisiana Gulf Coast, so we got a chance to go fishing. We would always go fishing when I was a kid, and this was one of the first times I'd been fishing as an adult. And then we were catching speckled trout and redfish and just having a great time. But as we were going through all these coastal byways and, and ways uh, around through the, the marsh of Louisiana, and he was driving, pointing things out. After a while, he'd say, you know, over there, there used to be a, a nice island. We always caught good speckled, speckled trout off that island. And then another way, there'd be a little beach, and he'd just be, be a little bit of a beach, and said, that beach used to go on for a whole mile. And we'd, we'd dock the boat here and catch, we'd catch all the redfish off the, off the pass there. And then another spot, he said, yeah, there used to be a sandbar here, and it was about three or four feet deep, and we could catch some good fish right in this area. But what he was describing was the rising sea levels. Louisiana is literally washing away. These barrier islands have been destroyed between hurricanes and, and, and different things. The Louisiana Gulf Coast is literally washing away. And I was able to see it with my own eyes, and areas that I went to as a kid are no longer there. The loss of coastal land will continue as temperatures rise, because as, as ice melts, the, the, the levels of the oceans will rise, and rising sea levels are a real and major problem. We must work together to limit rising temperatures so we can slow the melting of sea ice. Just as humans increase carbon emissions, guess what? Humans can decrease carbon emissions. That part's easy, right? 
If you can increase something, you can decrease something. Jim Williams of the Energy and Environmental Economics um, Study Group has listed five ways to get to carbon neutrality in the United States by the year 2050. And that's the goal. That'll, again, the, the, you know, at least leveling off before the temperatures rise too much. But he says in the next 10 years, there's five key things that we must do as a country. And remember, I'm talking about 10 years. We're not talking about tomorrow, over 10 years. And so when I heard these five things, I was actually encouraged. I was like, we could do that. Over 10 years, we could do that. The first one is we need to phase out all coal-powered plants in the next 10 years. Guess what? Shelby County's already closed the one coal power plant here because it wasn't efficient and it was cheaper for TVA to build a new um, natural gas plant. Natural gas isn't perfect, but it's better than coal. So it's going to happen in the next 10 years. The question is, a few places where the well, plants are newer, they're going to need incentives to do that, and that's where government policy comes in. The number two is, in the next 10 years, accelerate the switch to solar and wind power. Just in the past 10 years, solar and wind power is now the cheapest form of creating electricity in this country. No one thought it would happen that fast. So in the next 10 years, you're going to see more and more of that. You're going to see more battery storage and all that. So again, in 10 years, these two things can absolutely happen. In the next 10 years, when your car wears out, get an electric car. Again, not today, because they're still expensive today, but in 10 years, in 10 years, of things that happen in the next 10 years. The fourth one is a pretty hard one, and it's something we have to think about how we'll do this in 10 years, but it's to replace our hot water heaters and our heating systems with electric heat and hot water heaters. And the big businesses and the big campuses and the big hospitals. Again, it's not gonna happen in one or two years. This is a 10 year goal, and there has to be incentives that you get tax rebates or something to make those changes. And also heat pumps will slowly start to replace traditional air conditioners. And number five is stop adding new petrochemical infrastructure. In other words, five, 10, 20 years as we make these other switches. So in five to 10 years, there's things that we can do and that buys us time for the next 10 years to have some other um, policy and other science will have to be leading the way. Yes, some of this would cost extra. I wouldn't be excited about changing my hot water heater out, you know, but if there was incentives, there's ways that it, that, that would make sense. But there was, there's ways that we all have to work together to make it to our all to, to our best interest for everyone. Just like in the 70s, it was in the best interest of everyone to form the Environmental Protection Agency. We don't need to panic, and we don't need to disengage, but we do need to engage and push our government and leaders to make the switch to clean energy. And to make that a goal is always saying, how can we make that cleaner? How can we reduce carbon emissions? Government can give us incentives. And in fact, the amount of incentives that is needed is you know, when it's compared to our, 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 the amount of money we spend on other things, it's all within a reason. It's not totally out of, the, out of proportion. And then we think about how much insurance companies are already about going bankrupt, paying for more and more natural disasters. So in some ways, it will balance itself out. The government needs to give incentives. The government needs to lead in research. And we, the people of God, need to care for our earth. Remember, when God created And again, if you borrow something from somebody, you don't return it in worse shape, you know? You don't say, oops, I'm sorry, I broke it all up. You make it like We've made huge progress in the past 50 years. Literally, our air is cleaner than it was 50 years ago. Our water is cleaner than it was 50 years ago. Many species have made recovery in the past 50 years. We can cut carbon emissions. In the United States, carbon emissions are already started to fall. It's pretty amazing. Just in the last couple of years, we're seeing big impacts. And so in 10 years, we can make tremendous impacts. But the key is we have to work together. And that's the hardest thing to do in this country. What should be the simplest thing is the hardest thing. 
Can we work together? Can we have a common goal? Can we see that the dangers of rising temperatures will impact our grandchildren? And there is no, that, that's just gonna happen if we don't work together. Can we accept science is trying to help us with this and not just doing doomsday things? And can we accept that science changes, that science will figure out, we may, we may learn how to capture carbon and reduce carbon in a new way that we don't even know about today. Years ago, Congress passed major environmental legislation and it worked. These laws and regulations help clean our water and our air. We need Congress to pass legislation to incentivize the switch to green, clean energy. And that can happen in the next 10 years. God has given us the will, God has given us the wisdom. And God has uh, given us the duty to be good stewards of what God has created. So let us get serious about protecting our planet, not only for ourselves, but for our children and our grandchildren. Let us pray. Good and gracious God, we admit we don't like change and we don't like having to do different things. But we know we can be people of change and we can be people of vision. And we can work for the common good of all people, even for generations that aren't born yet. We can make sacrifices so that they can know the beauty of a sunrise. They can know the beauty of, a, of being outdoors in nature. They can know the beauty of the ocean and not see it as a threat. Lord God, we thank you for your good creation. We thank you that you created in wonderful and marvelous ways. And we thank you that you said it was good. Amen. Please stand for our hymn of the day. The morning has broken in 556 in your name. Sunday, we give thanks for God's good creation. We rejoice in God's abundance and the wonders and diversity of nature. Help us to be good stewards of God's creation as we love God and love our neighbors. Hear us, O God, when your mercy is great. Creating God, like a master artist, you have fashioned the universe out of your love and delight. Heal your creation where it is in need of restoration. The Wolf River, the Memphis Aquifer, and the Mississippi River. Provide all the inhabitants of the earth a peaceful and sustainable home. Hear us, O God. God of all, the nations hunger and thirst for your righteousness. Many call on you for guidance and strength. Answer the hopes with the peace of Christ. 
and give your loving kindness to national, state, and local leaders of people. Hear us, O oh God. Hear us, O Spirit. Healing God. You hear the cries of those in need and answer them in their distress. Grant to those who are sick and suffering your compassion and nurse them back to health and wholeness. Be close to the hearts of the lonely. Hear us, O God. The mercy is great. We give thanks for all who are able to donate blood today. We pray for all who are hospitalized and in need. We give thanks for the medical treatments and health insurance. Hear us, O God. The mercy is great. <laughs> Lord, we ask that you pour out each spirit upon John and M, Patsy, Dan and Joan, Larry, Wade and Pat, Jesse, Arlene and Caridad, Mark B, Opal, Roots, Lauren, Andrea, Wayne, Patty, Jin Ming, Laura and Jay, Andrandi and Eleonora, Matt Jr., Jill, Kurt, Samantha, Jane, Lauren, Jin, Ashley, and Ellie. Hear us, O oh God. Mercy is great. Lord, we ask for comfort and guidance for Bill and Sue P, for Clay, for Betty S, and for Anita, for Sandra, for John and Mary, the Brock family, Patty C, Tracy D, peace in Ukraine, refugees, victims, and families of gun violence. Hear us, O oh God. Mercy, Mercy is great. And Lord, we give praises to Marta Lopez Lord for Easter egg hunt success. And Easter Fellowship for Gavin Stedman and Leslie Robinson for Fellowship Setup and Cleanup for John and Maury Wellborn for Fellowship Donations, Holy Week Volunteers, Beth McGee, Connie White, Karen McCracken, Sue Malone, the Vitalis Blood Drive and Donations, and John Klein for coordinating, Easter Flower Cross Decorations, Earth Day, Lake Carnot. Sarah Houston, the Executive Director of Perfect, our Aquifer and the Thriver. Hear us, O oh God. Hear us, O God. Receive the prayers of your people. We offer are now prayers, both aloud or silent. God, we pray for Krista Shinneman as she finishes her walk across several states and as she returns to Memphis and Bartlett. We pray for her art project. We pray for her health and well-being. We thank you for her adventures in spirit and all that she learned during her cross-country walk. Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy is great. Gracious God, we also pray for our brothers and sisters in the Especially our brothers and sisters in the Ukraine who face conflict and violence and turmoil. Be with your church. May you raise up leaders of peace and reconciliation among nations. Hear us, O God. Accept the prayers we bring, O God, on behalf of a world in need. The sake of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. You may be seated. Um, we will not be passing the offering plate during our COVID restrictions, but the, uh, the basket is by the doorway, or you may be encouraged to give electronically at stlukememphis.org. We thank you for your tithes and your offerings.
Right, the congregation, please stand for the great thanksgiving. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is, it is right, right to give our thanks and praise. It is indeed right our duty and our joy that we should at all times and in all places give thanks and praise to you, almighty and merciful God, for the glorious resurrection of our Savior, Jesus Christ, the true Paschal Lamb, who gave himself to take away our sins, who in dying has destroyed death. And all the witnesses of the resurrection, with earth and sea and all their creatures, with angels and archangels and cherubim and seraphim, we praise your name and join in their unending hymn. <laughs> And after supper he took the cup he gave thanks and gave it for all to drink saying this cup is the new covenant in my blood shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin to this for the remembrance of me gathered into one by the holy spirit let us pray together as jesus has taught us to pray our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory. Come to the table, feast on God's abundant life for you. You may be seated as the ushers direct you to come forward. We invite you to come up the center aisle. You receive the bread in your outstretched hands. And you then partake of individual glasses of grape juice or wine. All is ready as the feast begins.
Please stand. Compassionate God, you have fed us with the bread of heaven. Sustain us in our Lenten pilgrimage. May our fasting be hunger for justice, our alms are making of peace, and our prayer the song of grateful hearts through Jesus Christ our Savior and Lord. Amen. Amen. Sending song is for the beauty of the earth. The uh, name is sent by St. Francis of Assisi in 1879. <laughs> Remember the poor. Thanks be to God.